Hello, my name's Zoe Laidlaw and I'm going to be hosting today's roundtable on linking the legacies of British slave ownership to Australian colonisation. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri Wollan people on whose lands in Melbourne I work and live and whose lands and sovereignty were never ceded. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to our final seminar on the theme of writing slavery into Australian history. Uh, this series has been presented uh, by the Western Australian Legacies of British Slavery Project in collaboration with the National Centre for Biography at the ANU. And for this final session today, we're extremely fortunate to be able to present a roundtable discussion and um, our intent is to reflect back on the previous six or seven seminars we've had in this series and think about what they suggest for the rest of our project. Um, I'm hosting this today from Melbourne, but the Zoom's being controlled in Perth and we've got two speakers from the United Kingdom as well. So uh, if everyone can cross their fingers for an hour of smooth Wi-Fi and no technical hitches, that might help us out. The plan for the session is that our two British partners, Catherine Hall and Keith McClelland, are going to start us off, um, each of them speaking for 10 to 15 minutes, offering some reflections on the series that we've just had over the last six or seven weeks, and that um, it's intersection with their own work on the British legacies of slavery. We're then going to offer our panelists here in Australia the opportunity to respond to what Catherine and Keith have to say. And we're also very keen to take questions and comments from any of you who are watching live. If you do have a question, I'd ask that you please put it in the Q&A box on your Zoom screen uh, rather than using the chat. So I'm going to introduce each of our speakers and then we can get started. So first, we're delighted that Catherine Hall is able to join us from London today. Catherine's Emerita Professor of Modern British Social and Cultural History at University College London, and she's the Chair of the Centre for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery. Uh, she's also a Fellow of the British Academy. Catherine's research centres on rethinking the relation between Britain and empire in the early and mid 19th century, and reflects on the ways that metropolitan ideas and practices have been shaped by the colonial experience. Catherine was principal investigator of the ESRC funded project Legacies of British Slave Ownership, which ran between 2004 and 2012, and then its successor project, uh, also funded by the ESRC and the AHRC, to the structure and significance of British Caribbean slave ownership, 1763 to 1833. At the core of these two projects was a database that contains the identity of all slave owners in the British Caribbean at the time that slavery ended, um, amassing and analysing information about those slave owners' activities, affiliations and legacies, um, and a, a major inspiration to the work of the Western Australian Legacies of British Slavery team. We're also joined from London by Keith McClelland, um, and we're very grateful that Keith is also able to join us at an on ungodly early hour of the morning. Keith now works part time in the Centre for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery and has a particular responsibility there for maintaining the Centre's database and its website. Keith was previously co-director of the Structure and Significance of the British Caribbean Slave Ownership Project and co-founder with Catherine um, and Nick Draper of the original Legacies of British Slave Ownership project. He was acting director of the centre from September 2019 through to May 2020. He's a social and political historian with a long-standing interest in forms of labour, enslaved, coerced and free. Now we've also got three of our Australian-based researchers on the Western Australian Legacies of British Slavery project with us this evening. I've introduced myself. I'm a professor of history at the University of Melbourne, and I have a particular research interest in how imperial connections constituted colonial conditions. But I want to introduce my colleagues, uh, Jeremy Martins, who works at the University of Western Australia, 
um, with research interests including the evolution of immigration restriction legislation in Australia, New Zealand and South Africa, as well as work on race, gender and the law in 19th and 20th century South Africa. Uh, notably, Jeremy is the author of uh, two books, Empire and Asian uh, Migration, Sovereignty, Immigration, Restriction and Protest in the British Settler Colonies, which came out in 2018, and Government House and Western Australian Society, which was published in 2011. In 2020, he was awarded the annual Marion Quartley Prize for the Mrs Freer case revisited, Marriage, Morality and the State in Interwar Australia. And finally, we're joined by Georgina Arnott, the project's postdoctoral research associate in history, who's also based at the University of Melbourne. Georgina uh, leads the project's theme, Revisionist Biographies, Forgetting and Remembering Slavery, um, and has therefore had a kind of guiding uh, influence over this seminar series. Um, Georgina, as we heard a, couple, a few weeks ago, uh, is centering her research for the project on high profile Western Australian families who arrived in the Swan River colony with connections to various forms of unfree labour. Georgina is also a noted historian and biographer with a focus on 20th century Australia and her first book, The Unknown Judith Wright, was shortlisted for the National Biography Award in 2017 and she's currently editing a collection of Wright's non-fiction work for La Trobe University Press uh, and Black Inc's Australian Thinkers series. Now I think you know who we all are. I'm going to hand over first to Catherine and then she'll be followed up by Keith. So you can unmute yourself, Catherine. Well, thank you very much, Zoe, um, for all those introductions. And let me first say what a pleasure it is, it has been to listen to the seminar presentations that have been given in this series. I've been so impressed by the team of people who are working on these issues and the amount of work already done. I haven't met all of you personally, but I've known everyone's work and it's a pleasure to develop this connection. Jane's introductory overview, Emma on Queen's London Sugar, Jeremy on pastoralism and the struggles over labor in Western Australia, Georgina on Sterling and his family, Malcolm on the echoes of slavery in Western Australia, Zoe and Georgie on national biographies. I haven't been able to one, watch the one on exhibitions because it wasn't available when I was looking. They've all given me food for thought and questions to pursue. My association with Australian historians began in 1991 with Marilyn Lake and Anne Kertoys. And over the years, I've been so pleased to maintain a connection with developments in Australian history writing. And now to see the impetus that the legacies of British slave ownership has given. And I very much hope that the conversation today will be part of an ongoing one. I feel that there's much to discuss. I thought I would simply raise three issues, two of them conceptual and all connecting to my own current work, which has grown out of uh, particularly the second phase of the LBS project. So I'm doing a study of the English slave owner, Edward Long, who lived in Jamaica for 12 years and wrote a seminal and authoritative uh, set of three volumes on the history of Jamaica. Well, my, my three points. First, one about the biographical method. The limits are obvious. The focus on individuals who leave records, the difficulties of recovering the lives of the subjective, the question of the relation to the big picture and so on. But the biographical method combined with prosopographical work has great strengths. The big data can focus our minds on the structural issues and take on the question of how representative, for example, those descendants of slave owners are in comparison with other investors and capitalists. While the biographical can take us into questions of lived experience, familial and sexual relations, psychic and emotional life. The genealogical work reveals the networks over time in such significant ways. And let me note Emma Christopher's discovery of the great nephews of Edward Long, 
whose family lived off the slavery business for generations, seeking their fortunes in the Queensland sugar economy. How significant, I want to ask, I suppose I've got three questions, basically. My three points are three questions for you. How significant is the big data, what we call the big data, which is the LBC, the LBS <laughs> database uh, for you? And will you be able to make, do you think, some estimate of the significance of the connections of the people you're working with, the descendants of slave owners and those with connections to slave owners, with other sources of capital and human labor? So in other words, what's the significance overall of this group of people that you're working on? Uh, is there any equivalent um, movement of capital and labor on this scale? Or are the other groupings who come to Australia, to the different Australian colonies? I mean, I can see that those who come to South Australia, for example, are in some ways a rather different group. Though, of course, um, Fife Angus was absolutely part of the slave owning connection. So that's my first question about the possible connections between the quantitative and the qualitative material. And I would, well, I can come to that. So my second point, in recent years, there's been a serious revival of interest in the term racial capitalism. And I've come to find this very helpful in my own work. I've drawn on three intellectual and political traditions from Marx, from the Caribbean, and from feminist historians to map a definition that aims to capture the particular conditions of the circuit of people and capital in the mid 18th century that connected England, the West African coast, and Jamaica. The Marxist tradition is vital to an understanding of the circuit of capital the Caribbeanists have insisted on the capitalist nature of the plantation economy, not that it was pre-capitalist, which is what Marx thought, but that it was full bone capitalist. The feminists have alerted us to reproduction, the gendering of slavery, and the particular forms of exploitation of black women. I focus in my own work on the hybrid system which developed in the mid 18th century Atlantic resting on mercantile capital, hereditary slavery and wage labor that harnessed the circuit of people, credit, commodities and social reproduction to capital accumulation. This was a particular racialized regime specific to time and place. And I echo Pat Patrick Wolf here with his emphasis on the many regimes of the, and the many temporalities and spatialities of racial regimes. I wonder if you have been thinking about the different regimes across the different uh, colonies. There's an obvious comparison between the pastoral and pearling economies of Western Australia and sugar in Queensland. Are these areas that you're interested in thinking about and what about the particular uh, capitalist formation, if that's what it is? Is that how you would define it? Is racial capitalism a helpful concept for you? I found the US historian Walter Johnson particularly helpful here. His two wonderful books, one on the Mississippi and now the one on St. Louis. In, in his study of the Mississippi Valley, he insists on looking at the actual existing practices of the cotton economy with its interlocking but distinct labor regimes rather than on abstract forms of what we might call capitalism and what we might call slavery. I found that very helpful. And I wonder if you think that's going to be useful in your own work. My third question is about the way in which racial thinking works and the concept that I've found particularly helpful here, which is disavowal. What are the logics and mechanics of racial thinking in the racial regimes in which you're exploring? 
How did pastoralists and the purling masters or the Queensland sugar planters establish the practices that attempted to fix the binaries between black and white and master the world in which they lived? The ability of these slavers to see and not see, I suggest was fundamental. They depended on disavowal and the denial of realities. The concept of disavowal, first articulated by Freud and subsequently developed by a range of other psychoanalytic thinkers, is central to understanding the erasure of race and empire in much British history writing. Freud asked, how do we remember, forget and reconfigure the past? And how is it that we can make a thing appear never to have happened? We can know, according to this account, something unconsciously, even as we are consciously innocent of the knowledge. Freud's thinking was based upon the idea that the mind is always conflicted and that we actively rid ourselves, sometimes unbeknownst to ourselves, of certain mental con contents. By splitting in our minds, we may misrecognize ourselves, avoid pain, bury our guilt, and disclaim our desires. Freud's emphasis is on an unconscious process, the rejection of a reality that is potentially traumatic. Forgetting is understood as actively produced, not just a matter of failed remembering, rather it is willed unconsciously. Forgetting is deliberate, the knowledge or event is denied and refused and then repressed. So disavowal is connected with a denial of external realities, a refusal to think about what is unthinkable, a wish to put aside what cannot be integrated in the mind. But disavowal always exists alongside recognition. Whenever we are in a position to study them, wrote Freud, acts of disavowal turn out to be half measures, incomplete attempts at detachment from reality. The disavowal is always supplemented by an acknowledgement. Anne Stoller describes that the, what she calls the imperial dispositions constructed by colonists to legitimate their own behavior. They learn to ignore, turn away, refuse to witness. These were the well-tended conditions of disregard that enabled slave owners, pastoralists, etc., to live with the contradictions of their practices. They could be loving family men and buyers and sellers of human beings, valuing only as hands and relying on violence and coercion to extract their labor. Disavowal can also be thought about in terms of collective memory, the evasions and displacements so characteristic of English culture, for example, the will to forget a difficult past. I'm interested in how you think about the different racial regimes of the colonies, an echo of my previous question about Western Australia and Queensland. Does the racial logic work differently in relation to Aboriginal peoples, for example, and South Sea Islanders? In attempting to understand the logics of racial thinking, what concepts have you found helpful? So those are my three questions about the relation between the overall numbers, as it were, of people involved in the development of capital and labor in the Australian colonies and the uh, constituency that you're so particularly preoccupied with. The question about the use of racial capital uh, as a concept and the question about the logics of racial thinking and the evasions and distortions that are associated with it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, I think we'll move straight on to Keith and then we'll come back and address some of those points that you've raised. 
Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. And like Catherine, it's a great pleasure to be here and be with you, at least in this virtual sense. Uh, let me say also a couple of things. One is that uh, what an impressive amount of work uh, and quality of work is represented in the, the seminar series. Extraordinary, really. Uh, and I'm full of admiration. Um, the second thing is a more local thing in a way which is to say that I'm so sorry that Alan isn't able to speak uh, in this session, and I wish him well. Um, well, what I want to talk about is uh, the question of biography within LBS itself. Um, so I'll make less obvious reference to the Australian work, but I, I hope that this bears upon what you are all doing. Um, and it's partly a response in particular to uh, the excellent paper last time from Zoe and or joint paper from Zoe and Georgie about dictionaries of biography. So I want to make some remarks about uh, biography in the project, but let me start by uh, saying something just in extremely general terms about uh, about the nature of biography. And this echoes uh, in good part what Catherine has just been talking about. Uh, clearly, what a biography aspires to do is to establish the contours and narratives of a life, uh, to fill out as much as possible what is known about a person from birth to death, uh, the trajectory that they take, um, the uh, familial and social context of that life, uh, the dominating and, and animating projects which shape it. Uh, and uh, to establish in some way the importance of that life uh, as an individual. And of course, many biographers, and this isn't the place to talk in, in any more detail about the forms of biography, but many biographers, and of course autobiographies, um, are uh, both teleological uh, and um, uh, and, in, and in some sense, um, tales of redemption so often. Um, that is to say, the determination of the life is how it ends up uh, and how somebody got there. Uh, it is almost impossible to imagine a biography which is written as if nobody knows how the life finishes. I mean, there are one or two attempts to do that, um, uh, but on the whole, people don't do that. What is much more common is the biography as, as I say, a tale of redemption or a tale of, of to use a ghastly cliche, much favoured by celebrity uh, um, biographies and autobiographies, including, for example, that of Tony Blair. Uh, they talk about a journey. Uh, a, a word which, in my view, should be banished from the English language, but that's another point. Um, uh, but there are three distinguishing features, it seems to me, of a biography. One is to establish the singularity of the individual, uh, what uh, indeed Sartre once called the singular universality uh, of an individual. Secondly, is to establish that the person was in some way visible to the wider society. And thirdly, that in some important ways, the subject has agency in the making of, of their own lives. That again, to borrow a phrase from Sartre, that it's possible for somebody to make of their lives something other than history has made of them. So, um, uh, at the same time, the biography is to situate, as I say, is to situate the person, person as singular uh, and uh, to locate them in relation to that larger history that Catherine was alluding to or referring to. Um, uh, the biographer will seek to place the subject as in some way carrying that larger history, at least in some particular moment. So in LBS, we have people who are carrying the history of slave ownership. Uh, on small scale, on large scale, there may be people like Sterling, whom uh, George's excellent paper was about, uh, and establishing that regard, things like family trees and so on. Uh, but the subject may be the exemplar of a particular political tradition or political formation or as a key figure. And of course, there are 
thousands of examples of that kind of thing, which range from not only the sorts of biographies that Zoe and Georgie were talking about, biographical entries in something like the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography or the Australian Dictionary, uh, but also in monumental tomes like, and I think of things that I have on my shelves, like Money, and, Money Penny and Buckles, six volumes, for God's sake, on the history of Disraeli, or thousand page tomes on contemporary politicians and the like. So in saying that biography is in some sense about singular individuals, this of course is also what is central to the LBS project. Um, but so too are the tensions between situating individuals as unique and indeed placing them as exemplars of formations which are larger than they are and trying to see the distinctiveness of any particular individual uh, within that uh, project but also in which the distinctive indi of individuals the distinctiveness of individuals might in effect disappear and be largely irrelevant as singular individuals they only matter as exemplars of those larger formations. Well, uh, the determination of the individual as central to uh, the LBS project is in good part a consequence of the very sources that we used. Um, that is to say that if you take the compensation records, um, then what they do is to push us to looking at individuals in one respect uh, because in part of the part of the explanation of this is because the only people who could uh, apply for compensation were to do so as individuals that is to say they couldn't apply on behalf of companies or of corporations of some kind or of institutions of some kind they had to apply as individual persons uh, and um, uh, they, of course, may well have been applying um, in effect on behalf of institutions, but they could only do so, as they say, as individuals. So the sources themselves push us towards a focus upon singular individuals. At the same time, um, the degree to which these people are visible is hugely variable. They are all visible in the sense that we have names of them. But often, and I will come back to this in a moment, often we know next to nothing or indeed nothing at all about them apart from the name and inferring from the name, the sex of the person. So to give you a, an entirely arbitrary example, Anne Eliza Richardson lodged two claims in Anguilla was awarded a total of 59 pounds, nine shillings and seven pence, uh, and was awarded the money on the 23rd of November, 1835. That is essentially what we know about her. Um, we uh, know nothing of where she lived. We know nothing of where she was born and died. We know nothing of her fam family and so on and so on. Uh, so she's minimally visible to us, uh, and her significance as a consequence that lies not in her singularity as an individual, so much as exemplifying other things, and in particular two things. One is, I'm thinking here of the kind of big data conclusions that we, uh, or investigations that we can make that Catherine referred to. One is that she is a member of that group of about 45% of claimants who were women. So her importance lies in that fact alone, uh, or uh, that is one of the key things about her. Uh, the other thing is that she was one of the numerous body of owners, many of them indeed women, um, who owned very small numbers of enslaved people. In her case, she owned three enslaved people, two on one claim, one on the other. And the, uh, what this means, at one level, is that while her visibility is, in a sense, pretty minimal, it rests upon the invisibility of the enslaved. They are represented, at least in the 
initial published account of the compensation records, parliamentary paper of 1837 to 38, uh, um, uh, they, they exist simply as numbers on a page. In that record, you see a name, you see the date of the award, the award, you see the claim number, where it was, and you see a number, and no more than that, for the enslaved. Uh, uh, and so her visibility, as they say, rests upon invisibility. Well, having said this, let me just say something about the extent to which we have biographies in LBS. And there are currently about 62,000 individual entries in the database. If one restricts the count to those associated with the Caribbean, that is excluding people associated with Mauritius or the Cape of Good Hope, where also there were, of course, uh, compensation claims made, then we've got about 47,000 people. And within that, we have biographical notes of greatly varying extent on about 20,300 people. That is, there are notes on about 43% of the Caribbean associated people. But within that, 66% of the biographies are very short indeed. That is where the biography or the biographical notes that we have is around about 100 words or less. And indeed, the shortest of all the biographies consists of a single word, um, such as resident uh, and nothing else. Well, another third are between about five, 500 and 1,000 words. Uh, and by comparison, a typical Oxford DMB entry is about 800 words. So we have a third or so which are, which are between 500 and 1,000. And we have only 1% of the entries which are more than a thousand words long. Uh, and incidentally, the longest of all is from a man called Charles McGarrell, which comes in at 2,700 words. In other words, something over half the individuals we have named, we know next to nothing about. And at about something over 80% of our entries, we know really very little indeed about them. But we do know, of course, and I've already said this several times, um, that they were associated with the compensation claim. Uh, and as we uh, move back, particularly to analyzing ownership since the mid 18th century, we know that they were owners of enslaved people or in some way within the orbit of uh, slave ownership. Well, I mentioned in relation to Anna Eliza Richardson that her visibility rested on the invisibility of the enslaved. And in a sense, of course, this is only partially true. We do have records of uh, enslaved people in which we can see their names, most notably the slave registers, but in some other documents. For example, in an inventory of the Harrow Plantation in St. Philip Barbados in 1811, I won't go through the whole thing, it's several pages long, um, but we have details of 189 enslaved people, uh, and they range from William, a carpenter who was worth 160 pounds, to Nat, who was a field laborer, also worth 160, to Philianne, who was a field laborer, and she was worth 150 quid, um, to, um, amongst the children, Harry, who was worth uh, 75 pounds and worked in the third gang on the plantation. And then as a final example, Lucy Ann, who was an infant uh, and was worth five pounds. So there is a sense in which it is possible to dig deeper uh, and find something like the visibility of enslaved people. And that is a tension which is permanent within, and in my view, unavoidable within LBS. That is to say the tension between two kinds of renderings. One is the visibility of people who are slave owners, who have some kind of agency, some kind of visibility as singular individuals, although that, as I've suggested, is often very minimal. At the same time, we, are, we have the rendering of the enslaved 
but the enslaved rendered within an intellectual, cultural, and political context, which makes them objects of calculation. In the mania for calculation in Britain in the early 19th century, that's how they are framed. They are framed, as Catherine suggests, as racialized subjects. And that tension is something which uh, has to inform and yet also something which we want to go beyond in LBS by investigating the material in the slave registers, and I can say more about what they contain and so on. What we want to do is to try to go beyond framing them, the enslaved, as objects of calculation and to restore some sense of not only visibility, but humanity to those people. And in a way, this echoes the kind of thing which, for example, Emma Christopher was talking about in her paper. Thank you very much. Sorry, I've gone on longer than I should have done. Sorry, Zoe. No, no need to apologise at all. That was fascinating. Um, thank you both for uh, characteristically um, leaving us with more questions to answer. We were hoping you were going to provide all the answers, I think, this evening. That's absolutely fantastic and so stimulating. Um, I think that Georgie and Jeremy will both want to respond, but perhaps um, given that you both spoke about um, a phrase that I'd like to banish from the language, which is big data, perhaps I could start there. I mean, I think one of the things, Catherine, that is emerging, um, and our project is still, uh, well, not only crippled by the fact that none of us can ever meet one another or travel to most of the archives we're interested in, but in its early days, but already I think any kind of um, sense that we were just going to be able to follow very obvious money trails from the compensation claims that were um, divvied up in London to Western Australia or indeed any of the other Australian colonies, we realise that those are pretty few and far between. So we are increasingly, I think, moving back and forth between trying, trying to juggle these individual life stories. Um, and I think Jeremy's paper and Georgina's paper about Sterling were really good examples of where we can follow some money and wrestling with the problem of how to trace a larger um, injection of capital into the Australian colonies. We know that there are groups of settlers who arrive at certain times and uh, Catherine mentioned uh, South Australia. There's obviously also systematic colonisers who head to Western Australia. There are groups of people who head out from Britain uh, to Australia taking resources with them. We are not, I think, yet in any kind of position to say how influential slave money from the slavery business was to Australia's settler foundations or the Australian, the settler colonies foundations. Um, but I think the questions that you raise will help us to edge closer to knowing why we can't answer that, even if we don't actually end up being able to answer that in any way that's satisfactory to us. Um, Jeremy, would you like to speak a bit about that? Is that something that you've really been wrestling with? Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I'd also like to just uh, respond, uh, in answering that, respond to some of what uh, Catherine was talking about in relation to, to racial capitalism. And I think uh, one of the questions, Catherine, that you had is, uh, have we been thinking about the different capitalist or racial capitalist regimes um, in Western Australia? And I certainly have been, and I also come from a South African history background, which kind of perhaps gives me a particular uh, inflection, if you like, um, when, when looking at this. Um, for me, with the, what really struck me doing my research on, on pastoralists and the way in which violence was central to the creation of labor regimes in Western Australia is how, and this is, touches on this idea of disavowal and denial, it's just how quick um, settlers were in rejecting those people who um, raised, 
questions about the treatment of indigenous Australians. And I'm thinking in particular, in the case of the research that I've done, Justiniani, who's a missionary. But then later on, and uh, Jane has talked, uh, has written about uh, Gribble uh, and Anne Kerthoys as well. He's a later missionary who's also hounded out of the colony um, for pointing out, you know, that there is um, slavery and, and forced labor and all sorts of atrocities. And my sense is just how you could, Catherine, you're completely right. This idea of disavowal and denial is absolutely essential to creation, creating these labor regimes in Western Australia. And it's a legacy that I think we continue with. You were talking in relation to the UK. I think here, the amnesia around um, these types of questions is, 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 is huge in Western Australia. And, and just to touch on what Keith was saying about tales of redemption, if we think of uh, the way in which Australians like to tell, or you know, white South Africans for that matter, like to tell stories about themselves, they often do have a kind of redemption aspect to that. And that's just another way in which you can uh, uh, kind of disavow the kinds of uh, violence that are integral to, to telling these stories. So I don't know if I'm really answering uh, Zoe's uh, question, or, um, but I just really wanted to respond to what both of you had to say in relation both to um, racial capitalism, uh, disavowal and denial, and also um, the way in which I mean, I, I haven't really focused specifically on biography in my work thus far, but just how you know there are these tales of redemption um, that uh, I think settlers are very keen to tell about themselves and their past. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I might, Georgie, would you like to chip in at this stage? Um, you Thank, thanks Zoe. Um, can you hear me okay? Um, I'm particularly interested in um, Catherine's identification of the process of disavowal as being central as well um, and disavowal being central to slave ownership which I know she's written about. You've written about Catherine um, and has been influential for me. Um, I wonder um, perhaps particularly in, in relation to Edward Long, given that you're thinking about him now, um, how significant you view um, the stories that families told themselves about themselves within this process of disavowal and of repressing recognition? How, I guess, the question is how significant um, and sustaining to British slavery overall were these family stories, which embedded um, the the values of the of the family, um, the slave owning family. And I guess I'm, I'm I'm clearly thinking of Sterling in this case, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about other slave owners. Can I respond? Um, well, thank you both, um, and Keith, for all more thoughts zipping around in my head. Uh, and of course, um, Jeremy, as you probably know, um, I'm sure you know, racial capitalism as a concept was first articulated in South Africa in relation to um, apartheid regimes. So I increasingly think that the money is not the most important thing at all. <laughs> that the money is the way of thinking about difference. I mean, sorry, not the money. The crucial issue about all of this is how difference is figured. And that that difference could be about uh, enslaved Africans, or it could be about Irish laborers, or it could be about um, Chinese migrants, or it could be about Jewish people. So that the, the construction of otherness, I think, is what is crucial. And the expelling of people who are not the same as us from uh, equivalent understandings of humanity. I think, that, I think that's the most important story to tell myself. Though, of course, I also think that if it wasn't for the, you know, if it didn't match up to capital accumulation, it would be a very different story. But if you think of, I mean, in the Australian context, it must be 
the case that the capital from slave owners is not, you know, it's not going to be 10 to 15 percent of the um, amongst the rich in the way it is in Britain, for example. I mean, that's what Nick Draper's been able to show right into the um, middle of the 19th century, 10 to 15 percent of, of the British rich are associated with descendants of slave owners. I'm pretty sure that's not going to be the case in Australia. It's a much smaller segment, but what they, what those settlers bring with them is already established patterns of the understandings of difference, which enable your settlers in Western Australia, Jeremy, to, to think that indigenous people are simply, you know, they're not like us. I mean, that's what it comes down to. They're not like us. And so they can be treated in quite different ways. So I would put the circulation of racialized ideas of difference as they circulate around the empire as absolutely key for all of us to understand. And in that sense, I think when, you know, one of the things I find most exciting about the Australian work is the demonstration of that happening but also the way you're going to bring different groups into it, because of course, in the Caribbean, the numbers of indigenous people is absolutely tiny. So although um, the question of genocide in one or two of the islands is obviously incredibly important, I mean, for most of the areas of colonization, of English colonization, that is not the key. The key is enslaved African labor. So that's my first point. And then the second, I mean, obviously, I think we could talk about all these things for ages, actually. So an hour is awfully quick to deal with such big questions. But hopefully, as I said, it's the beginning of a conversation or rather the continuation, not the ending. Anyway, completely fascinating also what you say, Georgie, because, of course, I think the family stories are absolutely vital. And one of the one of the stories that Edward Long tells in the history of Jamaica, though it's not to the fore at all, and unless you knew, you might not understand this, is how he is in a line of slave owners and colonists. And in telling the story of the island, he's telling the story of his family as well. And then that story is continued in his memorial, for example, where he's buried in England where the whole, where what is celebrated is his history writing and his family, not at all, you know, what he did in Jamaica. I mean, that's completely, that's totally erased and repressed. So I think the way in which, I mean, I think you're onto something really interesting there about the ways in which these family stories, which get reproduced as memorials, et cetera, et cetera, and become a standard part of 19th century understandings of history. I think that's another way in which these ideas get embedded and um, emasculated, or I can't think of the right word, but you know, the, the serious questions of violence and coercion disappear from that story. So very productive to think about these things. Um, can I just add to that very briefly that it seems to me that the the question of the question of money I agree entirely with Catherine the the what happened with the money is not the most important thing we can in most cases we don't know what happened to the money uh, unless you've got detailed financial records for particular families you can often simply not establish that uh, so and so put money into this or that or whatever. I think questions about race are the most important legacies. But what I wanted to comment on was the question of connectedness. I, it does seem to me extremely important to be able to establish, as for example, as Georgie has done with Sterling or, or, or Emma has done with the Davidson family, those kinds of connections between very specific individuals and families who are appearing in, in uh, Caribbean slave ownership uh, and those people who are setting up in Australia, developing businesses and all the rest of it. But I would also say that the connectedness is uh, something which we need to look at in relation to not only Australia, but to India. 
for example, the, the connections between the East India Company, Caribbean slavery, global capitalism, uh, seems to me extraordinarily important and under-researched, although we've got some important material in the database about it. So too, one could talk about this in relation to Canada and so on. And that connectedness in turn seems to me to, it's necessary to situate it within the kind of framework that, for example, Alan Lester has done in Ruling the World, where what he's looking at in the first part of it, or what they are looking at, he and his co-authors are looking at, are the new strategies for uh, uh, concerning labor, be it the end of slavery, the beginnings of indentured labor, other forms of coerced labor, not only within settler colonies like Australia, but to tie that in to the new strategies which are being developed within Britain itself around labor, which are not only uh, to do with um, some of the repercussions of the ending of slavery, but things like factory acts, poor law, reform, uh, strategies of, of labor in relation to Ireland, uh, and so on. So actually situating Davidson, situating Sterling, situating any one of these people within that global context of a reconfiguration of, of imperial labor seems to me a really important thing to be doing. Thanks, Keith. Um, well, thank you all, actually. I think one of the things that we're finding, and it would be interesting to know the degree to which you've grappled with this, is that we're finding connections that are sitting outside um, the compensation, you know, unsurprisingly. Um, Georgie talked about sterling um, and naval connections, those who are profiting from slavery by the, through the defense, a career defending the slave colonies, for example, or prize, um, prizes from the Admiralty. We're finding merchant houses that reorient their businesses from the Atlantic towards, you know, what they hope are new opportunities in Australasia. Um, and I guess, I, I mean, we think these connections are important uh, and we think there's probably a lot more of them that we will uncover it feels a little bit like there's a risk that we end up telling the history of everything um, and you know while i'm never shy of a challenge um, <laughs> keeping, sorry, keeping a focus on well i wondered how you'd wrestled within the lbs with this question of you know, the centrality or the initial centrality of those compensation records and then the way in which your project has, um, you know, grown over chronologically, but also in different sorts of engagement with Empire and all the different things that you're speaking about uh, this week, today. Well, I think, um, I think, you know, for a long time, actually, I've thought that this work that, you know, that Key's just um, mapped out about the connections across the empire, you know, it can only be an absolutely major collaborative project over many years. And already quite a lot of it's happened in the last 10 years, but there's so much more to be done. But I think that, you know, all, all any of us can do is do one piece of it, do one small piece of it, but each of the small pieces will add up to this bigger rethinking of the history of empire, which will be a history of, of connection, a history of difference, a history of capital. It will be all these things. But, you know, there's no way you can work on all the things at the same time, as you're saying, Zoe. So that the, you know, what's exciting actually from where I am to look at what all you are doing is the pieces of the puzzle that you're gradually adding um, to the to the beginnings of this bigger story that we have and and you know we shouldn't pretend I mean people have been doing this work for a long time so it's already building on um, I mean if I think of uh, of Anne Kertoy's and Jesse Mitchell's book you know, such a, um, I mean, an absolutely major intervention in understanding 
the development, not just of Australia, but understanding the development of the relation between metropole and colony. I mean, I've just read um, Jane Lydon's excellent new, new book on anti-slavery and no slavery in a free land, which makes some of the connections that he's been talking about. I mean, it, it's, very, there's a, it's a very productive field of work that we're all in, in our different ways. And I think that makes the connections between us and the ongoing conversations tremendously important. I think, um, of course, it's not possible to do all the history. I mean, it, in one sense, telling the history of a particular location, for example, we have a woman who lived in a house in High Shore in Macduff in northeast Scotland. Being able to identify that is very important, but it's also identifying that and that person as part of a hugely larger story. It's not that we can do or would want to do the empirical work, because that's impossible. What we need to do, it seems to me, is to be able to keep constantly come back to the conceptual frameworks within which we're thinking about these particular instances, whether it's a merchant house, a particular person. And, and developing that conceptual framework is a way of getting into dealing with very particular instances while never forgetting that larger picture. I think Alan has a, something to say. Yeah, I was just about to um, read out Alan's uh, comment in the chat. Um, we're very glad that he can be with us uh, in part. We were sorry that he was unable to participate as we'd originally envisaged. After I read this, I think Georgie's got a question from the other chat as well. So Alan Lester says, on racial capitalism, I think the resolution, as much as there was such, of the 1980s debate between Marxist and liberal historians of South Africa is instructive here. The Marxists were right in that until the late 20th century, apartheid served the interests of, a cap of capitalist regimes based largely on industrialist demands for cheap African labour. But by the 1980s, mechanisation, the need for fewer and more skilled labourers, and the requirements of a larger consumer market made much of apartheid's racially capitalist structure redundant. Um, he notes that Afrikaners catching up with English speakers' prosperity also had much to do with this change. What this shows, I think, is how dialectic the relationship between racial economic strictures, not the same thing as racism, and capitalism is. Uh, thank you very much, Alan. That's typically incisive. Um, we have only a couple of minutes left, and I know that we do have a question. I'm just going to ask Georgie if she can Hi, speak thanks. to that. Thanks, Zoe. Um, Rowena Hall asks a, a stimulating question. She's an artist wanting to represent invisible colonial histories and ask how um, others historians have approached what she calls sharing histories of the enslaved. And have we had ethical concerns about that? Thanks. Can I ask one of our British speakers to speak to that? Because I know that you have, um, well, Keith, you spoke generally to that problem just before, but perhaps Catherine or Keith could. Well, I'd say um, that, you know, there's been such a, an important um, uh, set of issues for artists about how to represent difference, how to represent blackness, how to represent invisibility. I mean, there's just a, there's a, a great body of artistic work on that in Britain now, which I couldn't, you know, I couldn't hope to, um, to speak about. But I'd say it's been an issue, uh, certainly, that's been on the surface, certainly since the 1980s, um, how to represent difference. Thank you very much. Um, we're, we're running out of time. I just want to note um, that we've also had a, um, a comment from Emma Christopher. Thanks, Emma, um, who, of course, also contributed to this series uh, and saying that she agrees very much that in terms of Queensland, um, the influence and legacies of slavery are about much more than money and that the way the planters in Queensland disavowed, um, she, she finds resonances in the way that the planters and in Queensland disavowed their pasts and their family pasts. 
Um, I think that's something that we're finding at, at every, every turn, actually, as we go through this project. I'm conscious that, um, not quite sure what happens, whether we turn into pumpkins or what, but that it is ticked over to the end of the hour in whatever time zone you are. So that's 7 p.m. in Melbourne anyhow. I'd like to conclude by thanking um, especially Keith and Catherine for their presentations and Alan for joining us also for London. And I'd like to thank Jeremy and Georgie uh, for their contributions this evening, um, but also all of our speakers through uh, the series. It's been fabulous, really stimulating, and I think will lead firstly to a special edition of a journal. So stay tuned for that, but also to um, some really great ways to structure our project as we work through the next few years. I'd also like to thank Kate Pattinson for some fantastic organisation. And it's down to Kate that if you would like to catch up on any of the other um, seminars that we've had over the last couple of months, um, you can find uh, those via our web page. I think Kate is going to send out an email to everyone who's here this evening, which provides a direct link to that web page. So we do hope you'll go and catch up on any that you missed. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. Um, and we look forward to the next event, which we haven't yet decided on from our project. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye bye.